So today's talk is vulnerability, exploring one of the greatest gifts we have to share with each other. And there's a part of me that wants to be done now, <laughs> because I'm not sure if Home Office has ever put out this theme like this before. So the theme for the month from Home Office is vulnerability. Week one, vulnerability. Week two, vulnerability. Week three, vulnerability. Week four, vulnerability. Week five, vulnerability. So we have five weeks of vulnerability. And I'm pretty stoked because we have three of my favorite spiritual inspirers and people who help teach me spiritual wisdom. We have Reverend Elijah, we have Reverend Gail, and we have Eugene, who all are going to be contributing to our journey into vulnerability this week. So I'm delighted about that. And what I hope for us all, that at the end of this month, we have a much deeper understanding of shame, fear, courage, and vulnerability. Um, and I know what's happened for me, and I, my intention for today is that maybe you leave with some questions that hopefully will be visited in these weeks to come. Some questions like, what does shame mean to me? What is shame? When have I felt shame? What did I do when I felt shame? And then this was a real hard one. Have I ever shamed anyone? It's like, ooh, that one was a bit tricky. Questions like, what does courage mean? What helps me be courageous? When do I fail to be courageous? What does vulnerability mean? How does vulnerability show up in my life? What do I do to explore it consciously? So I'm hoping that, you know, today we all start to have some of these questions percolating in our brain so that in the next few weeks, we maybe have some answers. So first, I want to read CSL for the, the week. The power of vulnerability. Vulnerability, defining and aligning. Aligning, <laughs> sorry. I bring my own unique expression to life and create a safe space for others to do the same. That's the affirmation. The little blurb is, hearing the word vulnerability often makes us cringe. Anybody cringe when you hear that word? Yeah, it's like, ooh, okay. I cringed when I saw the whole month was about vulnerability. Let us begin our journey into vulnerability. So today, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be giving, beginning our journey into vulnerability. I think it's fair to say the queen of teaching and sharing about shame, fear, courage, and vulnerability is Brene Brown. Give me a thumbs up if you know Brene Brown. Brilliant. And she has spent over 20 years sharing on that. And so I have to say, I felt like I lived in her bedroom this week. Because every day I've been listening to her, I've been transcribing her. She even now has a Netflix. So she's on Netflix, she's on YouTube. I've been absorbing this book, I've been transcribing everything. So this is her best-selling book, Daring Greatly. How the courage to be vulnerable transforms the way we live, love, parent, and lead. And I love it when there's a first page that just grabs. <coughs> so the phrase daring greatly, in the first page, it's the introduction. <coughs> she tells us, the phrase daring greatly is from Theodore Roosevelt's speech, Citizens in a Republic. The speech, sometimes referred to as the man in the arena, was delivered at the Sorbonne in Paris, France on April 23, 1910. This is the passage that made the speech famous. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how str the strong man stubble, stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again and again. 
because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? At least fails while daring greatly. And that was what gave her for the title of this book. And she talks a lot about walking into the arena. I, I, part of me wants to just kind of put a chair here and just read from this book. Renee Brown. We must walk into the arena, whatever it may be. A new relationship, an important meeting, our creative process, or a different, difficult family conversation. Walk in with courage and the willingness to engage. Rather than sitting on the sidelines and hurling judgment and advice, we must dare to show up and let ourselves be seen. This is vulnerability. This is daring greatly. We must dare to show up and let ourselves be seen. This is vulnerability. This is daring greatly. So I found myself input, input, input. I was putting so much input in. And some of you know that I'm a little control oriented when it comes to certain things like having my talk ready by Friday afternoon. Well, by Friday night, I was still input, input, input. And so yesterday morning, I was like, OK, Deborah, you have to write the talk. You have to write the talk. And it was fascinating. It was a fascinating day. Because those questions kept answering themselves. And it was really interesting how many tears I had yesterday. But they weren't tears of sadness. They were like these exquisite tears of remembering experiences that I had never framed as vulnerable. That I had never looked at them as vulnerable. And I can't even tell you. And there was a few of the stories that I kept coming back. And I would just have these tears. And they really were exquisite tears of vulnerability. Um, my next thing. And a lot about what she talks about is connection is why we're here. We are here to connect. We are hardwired to connect. Um, and Renee Brown has studied thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people and had conversations with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And what she did was she gave a name to people who know they belong, know they have a sense of worthiness, and have resilience to shame. And she called them wholehearted people. Isn't that lovely? Who wants to be a wholehearted person? Isn't that beautiful? And so this is what she says. Wholehearted living is about engaging in our lives from a place of worthiness. It means cultivating the courage, compassion, and connection to wake up in the morning and think, no matter what gets done and how much is left undone, I am enough. It's going to bed at night thinking, yes, I am imperfect. I am vulnerable and sometimes afraid. But that doesn't change the truth that I am brave and I am worthy of love and belonging. I am brave. I am worthy of love and belonging. So I need to put the book down, because I have so much in there I would like to share from that. But I, know if, I don't know about you, but I would love to have the experience of being a wholehearted person. So just a quick thing, because I'm going to come back to it. But I think that she very simply sums up what is shame. And she says that guilt is feeling like I did something bad. Shame is I am bad. Guilt is feeling like I did something bad. Shame is I am bad. 
Shame is about feeling like we're not worthy of belonging. We're not worthy of love. Um, and I'm going to come back to shame in a little bit. Um, one of the many things I love about Brene Brown is she's a storyteller. She's a great storyteller. If you listen to her, one story after the other. I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody tell stories of her intimate relationship with her husband in so much detail as she does. It's awesome because over these years, she's really become someone who dares greatly, who goes in the arena, and she shares her story with an open, full heart. That's what she does. That's what she does. And as you know, I like to teach through stories, so it was very validating to hear that from her. So I have a couple of stories today that really came up big time for me. When I asked myself the question, when have I been vulnerable? The, the answer was a time that was probably the most vulnerable in all of my adult life. Um, and she, you know, if Renee can share a story from 20 years ago, I can share one from 10 years ago. So in a split second, my life changed one morning at 8.15, when as a result of an accident, I had triple shattered bones in my right leg, shattered in three places. Unfortunately, somebody took me to the urgent care. And urgent care showed me this really gnarly x-ray, and they literally put an ace bandage around it, gave me a couple of Advil, sent me home with an appointment to the orthopedic surgeon on Thursday. And I have to tell you, I was in my, I, mean, I don't know if any of you have had a broken bone, but I had three shattered bones. And so I had this goal of Thursday. I can make it till Thursday. He's going to, and I might, in my story, he will operate on me on Friday. This is where we're going. So I just spent those next few days, like, laying as still as I could. So we go to the orthopedic surgeon. And he looks at my leg, and he says, I can't help you. And I'm like, what the, please? What do you mean you can't help me? I can't help you. I cannot help you. Urgent care should have sent you to the ER so you could have had surgery on Monday. You're going to have to go to a trauma surgeon, and nobody will operate on you until at least two to three weeks. My leg was huge by this time. He said it would be dangerous and could cost you your life. Nobody will operate on you. So we have to spend the next couple of weeks getting the swelling down so it's safe for you to be. And I burst into tears because I had my whole story, you know, was, and it was just, in hindsight, very vulnerable to have this man saying, I can't help you. Then what was interesting was he went out and we heard him on the phone to urgent care and he was basically screaming at them that, you know, what they had done was so wrong. And so I'm somebody who is pretty self-sufficient, you know. And while I've had many men in my life, I haven't lived with many of them. So a lot of the time, I've lived by myself. And I know how to live by myself. I'm real good at that. Very good at it. And... My father taught me a wonderful lesson about giving. My father was a huge giver, not of his emotions. He didn't really have emotions that we ever saw. But he was very generous with money, so generous. And that's what he taught me. And when he died, we got letters from all the way around the world sharing about his generosity. So I was always somebody who loved to give. I loved to give. I love to take people out to lunch. I like to find the perfect thing for a friend at TJ Maxx. I love to give of myself and listen to people. Being a practitioner is all about giving. So I was a great giver. But I knew shit about receiving. And I was always very controlling. Because there's some control. If you want to be, just think about what's your balance in here. Are you more comfortable giving or are you more comfortable receiving? I had no skills to receive. And there I found myself on my bed. For two to three weeks, the goal was try not to move because the pain was so excruciating. You talk about vulnerable. You talk about vulnerable. 
my one of my dearest friends, Gail, set up a schedule every day so that people would bring me my food. They found a home health care person oh God, who had to come in and help me bathe. And you talked about having been cracked open. I was unwillingly cracked open into the deepest vulnerability I have ever known in my heart, life. And it sucked. It was beyond painful. And so it was, it was incredible, you know, I was at the church at the time, so my friends and church people, everybody was showing up. I don't think I've ever had a bigger freezer full of food because everybody, what, one thing they could do was bring me food. And, um, but then I had the you know, late evenings and night times and middle of the nights to myself, and I sobbed for that first week because it was so painful to have to receive on that level. But I didn't have a choice. I had a porta potty by my bed, and when a friend came in, I had to ask him to empty it. That felt really vulnerable. And so I felt like oh, so powerless and helpless. And then after about a week, you know, I had to have a conversation with myself is you have to change this because this is going to be your reality for a week and a half. And, you know, it's not helping that you're not accepting what is. And so I started to have a shift and to just say, okay, you're going to just practice saying thank you rather than saying thank you, you, did, you didn't need to. But, of course, they all did need to. So I practiced saying thank you for the next week and a half. And I have to tell you, the most beautiful lesson from that experience, I love to receive. You want to take me out for lunch? Great. You want to buy me something? Great. You want to listen to me? Great. And so that was the beauty of that, is being opened up in a raw way in vulnerability that I had never been taught me the lesson of receiving. And that's a beautiful lesson that we all need to know. Another, it was interesting, it was only yesterday that I started putting my own connections together about what was vulnerability. Because if I had spoken on Friday, the only things I had to say were what Brene Brown was telling me. But yesterday, these connections started coming in my head about vulnerability. So there was another connection that I could tell in that story. So I'm a contract worker, and my friends knew I kind of lived check to check. And of course, there became, became this panic in my friends. Well, how's she going to pay her bills? How's she going to pay her bills? She's not going to be able to work for months. How is she going to pay her bills? And so then they all started this conversation with me about suing. Now, I understood where it came from in them because they were panicked that I couldn't, wasn't going to be able to pay my bills. But there was no place in me that could entertain the concept of suing. I just knew I had to hang in there till I had this fixed. And so I couldn't entertain that. And I, I mean, I understood where it came from in them, you know. So I started talking to God. And it, one night, in the middle of the night, I had one of those spiritual awakenings when you feel something deeper than you've ever felt it in your life. And it was faith in God. Because the truth is, God had to help me. Because I didn't know how I was going to pay my bills. But I had to trust and know that God did. I had to trust and know that God did. So then what happened, and we have laughed about this over the years, my friends would come in and start to talk about it. Don't worry, God's got it. God's going to pay my bills. And they all told me afterwards they would have these conversations, but I think she's taking many, too many pain pillars. I think she's smoking too much pot. You know, she thinks God's going to pay her bills. But I did believe that. I did believe that. And I saw a connection between empathy, not empathy, excuse me. I saw a connection between vulnerability and having the courage to stand in your spiritual truth and says, God's got this. How often do we actually do that? Stand in our spiritual truth. And every cell of my being knew God had it because I couldn't. I knew it. I had faith like I'd never had in my life. I had faith. And so it was an interesting thing with my friends. And finally, I said, you know, I don't want any more conversations about suing. If you ever talk about that, talk with each other. I'm done. God's got this, okay? 
God got this. So about 10 days into this journey, I'm lying. My friend Loretta shows up in a couple of these stories. My friend Loretta is laying on my bed with me. It's nighttime. And I was like, oh, my God, I haven't checked my mail in forever. So you go get my mail. So she gets my mail. And Loretta's a trip, full of personality and piss and vinegar. She really is. She's, she's a trip. So I'm looking through my bills, and we're watching TV. And I quietly say, Loretta, I've got $10,000. And later, she was thinking, silly bitch, she's got one of those checks. You know those checks that they send you that aren't real, but you know, they're like, oh my, she's like, oh my God, she's just so out of it. How am I going to tell her? And I said again, Loretta, I just got $10,000. And I passed her a card. And a friend a year before had died and had left me a $10,000 CD that I had no idea about. I had no idea about. And when we have Faith in God, faith of God, 100%. Miracles happen that we couldn't even imagine. We couldn't even imagine. But the vulnerable piece of that was having the courage to own that when my friends thought I was a nutter. I mean, they just thought I was a nutter. So um, as I only wrote this yesterday, I have to think about where I want to go next with my This is very interesting. I'm looking for something and I'm not finding it. Okay, sorry. Usually I know where I'm going, but I got stuck here. I guess I'm feeling vulnerable about being up here. My favorite quote about vulnerability, it's probably the only quote I ever had before Brene Brown and I've had it about 20 years, is from a man called Paul Williams. And it is, your vulnerability, not your light, is your most attractive quality. All people give off light, but vulnerable people let light in. Your vulnerability, not your light, is your most important quality. So I've got an experience to share with you that has shame in it and has vulnerability in it. So shame, I, I am bad, I am bad. So what this came up for me yesterday, and this is a story that just brought me to tears numerous times during the day. So it was a few years ago, and it was like the spring, and I had a couple of workshops to do at one of our local elementary schools in the afternoon. So I went there. And I hadn't worked with this staff before. So this woman walked in, and she looked at me. And the moment she looked at me, she hated me. I knew it. She looked at me, and she hated me. And so teachers are not an easy crowd, if you've ever done a workshop with teachers. So on the back row, there was all this. So I remembered public speaking 101 when I first started speaking. If you were doing that and you weren't with me, I would be looking at you desperately to get you in. But what you learn as a public speaker is if people aren't with you, ignore them. So I did the best job I could to ignore the lovely women on the back table who were talking about me. I don't think in a very kind way. I don't think in a very kind way. So um, I left. Well, I had to go back the next week. I had two workshops in a week. So I went in there, and I was setting my stuff up. And I have no idea what her name is, because I called her the bee. I guess you can imagine. So she walks in, and she looks at me. And this look of disdain and disgust and hatred came over her face. And it pushed a button in me. I mean, hopefully, if you were going to put 10 adjectives down about Deborah, bitch wouldn't be in the first 10. But it's there. It's there. And that button got pushed. 
She did not install it, but it got pushed. And this time, she was mean, I was meaner. She was mean, I was meaner. In my whole professional, personal, spiritual career, I've never shown my ass in public. I'm so trained to be polite. I showed my ass. Absolutely, unequivocally, I showed my ass. It was terrible. And Renee says, Shame is the feeling you get walking out of a room of people you know are saying hurtful things about you and you know you can never walk in there again. That was exactly how I felt. I will never be able to walk in that room again. Luckily, I wasn't going to have to, but that was how I felt. And for the next few days, it, I suffered. I suffered because I felt I am bad. I am not worthy. It was awful. It was just awful. I was so disappointed in myself. And I, I didn't quite know how to do it because I'm not used to having to deal with that. Showing my ass in public is just not usually the way I go. But anyway, so of course that place in me healed and I swore I'd never do it again. And I also swore I'll never go back and do a workshop for those people. Now I had to go back a few times to that school. And when you walk in the office, she was in fifth grade. You walk in the office, you go straight fifth grade, you take a left, and you go to kindergarten. And so I had some kindergarten first grades, and I would walk in there and almost run by the office and down there. So my whole thing was, I don't want to see the bee. I don't want to see it. And so I was there maybe four or five times, and then I didn't have to do it anymore. Well, that was, before school got out, was when my journey with cancer started. And so that was what my summer was about, was journeying through cancer. And my same friend Loretta was one of my main support people, and I knew it was very hard on her. And I had thought one day when I was going to her house that I saw the bee driving her car by Loretta's house, but I was like, oh, maybe it's not her. So anyway, I went through this summer journeying through. <laughs> and this is quite fascinating. So I go back to school in September, and I go from school to school. And people kept having the same conversation with me. Deborah, it's you. I'm so glad you're OK. And they would hug me. And then they would say, I heard you were dying. I can't tell you how many people said to me, I heard you were dying. But they were so like, oh, I prayed for you. I was just, oh. And people just shared. Some people had tears. I mean, and you know what? In my mind, I was like, I wish you'd just shut up. I did not want to think about cancer. I didn't want to talk about cancer. And what was happening was I was done being vulnerable over cancer. But these people sharing their heart and soul, and these aren't, I wouldn't call them friends. I would call them work colleagues that maybe in some time, if it was right, we might be friends. And there's a lot of those. I've been in this district almost 25 years. So there was a lot of people that cared about me. And so then I got to see a connection between vulnerability and allowing somebody to have empathy for you when you don't want them to, when you don't want them to. So that was a connection I put yesterday, that sometimes we may have to be vulnerable, you know, and let somebody love us even when it makes us too vulnerable, because that was what was happening. Everything they were bringing up was just bringing up all this vulnerability, and I just so didn't want to go there. So. One day, I have to go back to that school. And I'm like, OK, I got this. I got this. And I was going to the early grades. So literally, I go in. You have to sign in. I ran to, you know, I'm good to go. And so I'm coming out. And it's like, holy shit, she's in the office. And it was kind of a glass office. And I literally, I'm sure I was almost running with my, I always have lots of bags. And I heard, Deborah. And I turned around, and it was her. And all of a sudden, she was standing right here in my bubble. She was standing here in my bubble. And I froze. I absolutely froze. I froze. And she looks into my eyes. And there are times where you have conversations in your life that you remember every word, right? There are those conversations. 
And this is a conversation I will always remember every single word. So she said, I hated you the moment I saw you. I laid my, hand, I laid my eyes on you, and I couldn't stand you. I hated you. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry for how I treated you. I didn't know who you were. I didn't know who you were. Now, I knew that Loretta, one of her coping skills was to go to the pool at her apartment. She said, I spent a lot of this summer in the pool with Loretta. Loretta loves you so much. She was so scared. It was so painful for her to watch you suffer like you were suffering. And she said, you know, I held her a few times when she had tears. And I got to know who you were because I didn't know who you were. I didn't know who you were. And then she said, you know, I know things have been really hard for you. I'd never cry up here. She said, I know things have been really, really hard for you. And I want you to know that if you ever need anything, if you ever need a place, I have a spare room. If you ever need anything, I would be honored to give it to you. And I dropped my bags, and she dropped what she had, and we just held each other. We held each other. And then I kind of stepped back, and we both had tears streaming down our face. And I said, thank you. Thank you. And I walked out. So she had the courage to step into the arena. She had the courage to show fully up and be seen by me, be truly seen by me. And I think it's a beautiful example of your vulnerability, not your light, is your most attractive quality. All people give off light. Vulnerable people let light in. And so it is.